Okay, welcome to another episode of the Purple Heart Podcast. Today I'm here with Izzy Woolwood. And uh, just tell a bit about yourself and why you've come on today. Um, so yeah, I'm Izzy um, and I'm currently in my third year at UBA studying history. Nice. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. I've wanted to speak about my experiences with mental health for a long time. And obviously I wish the circumstances were better for this podcast, but I'm excited to speak speak what I've got to say. And hopefully if it touches one person, then that's a step in the right direction. That's so, good. Yeah. So for, the, the, for those of you that don't know, we went to school together. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Bennett was fun. Did you mm. enjoy it, most of it? Most of it. I'd say sick form was my least favourite, but yeah, we'll come much. on to that. Yeah. yeah. No worries. And so what do you think has been the main challenge for you in terms of mental health like what's been like the thing that's been affecting you the most um definitely anxiety so um if you were to describe anxiety because people some people find it hard yeah what actually is anxiety how would you best describe that so i think a real big misconception is that anxiety is worrying or just overthinking and it 100 percent is but it's just a minor part of it um anxiety is physical it's consuming it it can be really intense um and I think we need to move away from just thinking oh she's worrying like Mm. that's you know that's anxiety yeah um and actually especially with me when I have anxiety I get anxiety about having anxiety it's it's just it's a complete cycle and it's it's a fear definitely um, so yeah, I've, I've suffered with anxiety disorder probably for about six, seven years now. Right. Um, I've had something all my life. I've definitely been a big warrior all my life, but particularly anxiety and the physical symptoms of it and things like that for, yeah, for all oh, my right. school life. And you said it life. for about seven years and mm. was it like a triggering event or how did, how did it come about? Um, not that I can remember. Um, I think... I, yeah I don't know when it started it just I just I remember it very clearly and it started with just these really intrusive negative thoughts um that I couldn't budge and they were thoughts that were just so ridiculous mm. and frustrating because it meant I couldn't focus on anything else um you know it was at a time of my life where my other half um was going through some difficulties as well with chronic fatigue and I think together like in our relationship it was just you know we were going through quite a lot mm-hmm. um but we're still together so that's good surely we did something right <laughs> <laughs> no that's good and um because i have a friend of mine who said that he's at the moment experiencing these intrusive thoughts mm-hmm. and for those for those of you that don't understand or what it's like is does it consume you quite a mm-hmm. lot of the time or is it like in certain periods of the day or is, yeah. and is it does it feel like it's someone else's voice in your head? Yeah, um, I describe it as brain fog. Right. It's really hard to describe it like properly, but what it feels like is that you've got so many thoughts and it's just like you can't think of anything else. It's mm. so consuming. And it might be, for me, um, when I've had it more recently, it will be like five minutes of like peace and then it will be like all in again. Really like hurtful thoughts. Um, and now I'm in a, in a a good like headspace and I recognize how I felt as ridiculous and like, why was I thinking like that? Mm. Um, but yeah, it is consuming. And I think actually sometimes the best thing to do is recognize that that's how you're feeling and that's what you're thinking. Take a step back into it. Take a step back and just admit okay like i'm i've got brain fog like i've got brain fog yeah you know (laughs) yeah that's Um, i think the first thing with a lot of things is like the acceptance of it instead of like yeah trying to figure out all in the same moment it's just to like accept okay this is what's Mm -hmm. happening right now and then maybe try and move from there yeah you also mentioned um like the physical effects of like anxiety yeah do you want to speak a bit more about that yeah so um particularly i'd say in the last sort of 18 months so with lockdown and covid obviously it's been horrific time and really hard on a lot of people um and i think for me my anxiety is triggered by big events and when my coping mechanisms were sort of taken away from me um it made things really difficult um and so yeah in the first lockdown i think my anxiety turned very quickly into this sort of depressive state um and i would experience these panic attacks where um, if you've ever had one it just like your whole body goes numb and like tingly mm. and um, you can't breathe and the the tight chest is just horrific um, and there were a number of occasions where 
yeah, just really horrible. Just be lying on the floor, like not being able to breathe and thinking, oh my goodness, like, is it something else? Like, am I actually having a panic attack or no, is it like something, something more serious? serious? Because like allergic reaction or some, some kind of yeah, medical because thing. Because that is how intense they can be. Um, and it's scary. And I, I never want to have to go through that again. Um, I unfortunately have done, you know, like more recently yeah. with Elisa's passing and stuff. Um, but yeah, the fi- I think the physical side of anxiety is something that maybe not everyone thinks about or right, sees yeah. I think a lot of the time people just think it's in think the head it's all in the head and it's all yeah. just like oh she's worried about this she's worried yeah. about but actually it is crazy time and time again we're being it's been proven to us that like what happens in our yeah. head does affect our physical body yeah 100% and it, okay, it can be scary and yeah. do you know like what triggers it mainly or does it just come out of nowhere these panic attacks I don't I think my triggers in the past have been the, like the unknown and not knowing so in lockdown, obviously that was a big thing. Right. You know, I'd I'd read the news, look at the news like thirty times a day, which is horrendous, and nobody should do that, especially no. in a pandemic. Um, and so I think, yeah, I was just feeding my body like bad things, and but I couldn't help myself, yeah. and then that triggered it. Um, yeah, in uh, sick form, I was also on the bus to work one morning, and this guy had like this really severe epileptic fit um it was quite yeah it wasn't very nice to watch obviously Mm. um and as somebody who doesn't really deal with people being ill around them anyway um it was yeah not a nice experience um the way he collapsed meant I couldn't easily get off and you know that fight or flight feeling and I always have that flight and I couldn't um and yeah, that had some bad repercussions on my anxiety big time. I um, couldn't go to like a doctor's appointment without one of my parents being there, you know, and mm. this was when I was 18, like I was an adult yeah. and I couldn't go to a doctor's appointment by myself because I had this fear that I would collapse or something would happen to me and I was on my own. Right. Um, and there were some bus journeys to school, you know, I live a good over an hour walk from school okay. and there would be mornings where, I would have to get off the bus because I could see traffic. I could see it was a crowded bus and I just freaked. Um, And, you know, there was one winter morning and I was in like sick form clothes and it was freezing outside and I walked all the way to school because I couldn't deal with the the chest pain and the the fear of what happens if. Um, And yeah, that was exhausting. And that that took a, yeah, that did a lot for my... And a a lot of time when you were on the... the, uh bus you could would you think oh something like this might happen again or you have like flashbacks to when it happened the first time and these triggers start <clears> um <throat> even though maybe something's not even happening but just being in that same sort of setting mm. or surrounding and cause them to come back yeah 100 yeah, percent. i think that, well obviously you found it quite hard because then it mm. affected your day-to-day life because you have mm. we were walking in the cold instead of mm. actually being able to get the bus yeah 100 percent. i think there's like so many different triggers out there mm. um i think even today a minor thing could trigger me um with recent so recent events with Elisa, little things trigger me, um, yeah. and it's just learning again to just recognise those triggers and trying to push through them. But I mean, I'm proud of myself because I went to a festival last weekend yeah, and I was in the crowd and I was having a great time. And I know I was telling all my friends, I was like, if this was me two years ago, yeah, I would have like, yeah, nah, really it wouldn't good. have happened. What so sundown in orange oh, that nice. well-known one <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but no that's yeah you must, yeah you must be very proud of yourself to go from yeah. where you were to where you are now yeah and do you have a lot of coping mechanisms do you have therapy or things like that or um so one of the yeah one of my biggest regrets is not getting therapy and not seeking help quicker i think it took me a good couple years to properly mm. talk to people about how i was feeling um and open up to my friends and i think even in sick form a very like small number would have known what I was going through um and I think in some sense the lockdown was a blessing which I can't believe I'm saying this but because I learned that sport and exercise was my coping mechanism and um I've always been really sporty but in this last year I've made an effort to get back into swimming and netball and go to the gym and things like that to be really active um don't get me wrong sometimes I go to the other extreme and do too much and push yourself too hard I push myself because if I'm feeling rubbish I'm like I've got I exercise because this is gonna make me feel good um 
but definitely sport and yeah I mean I'd say like even if you absolutely hate sport with passion <laughs> just get air and like get out because mm. it does like get, a get world moving. of good yeah because yeah. you can you can lay in bed all day and it just and you're just left with your thoughts but if once yeah. you're being active you're being distracted and maybe you're playing some yeah. kind of physical game with your friends and you're involved in yeah, that it kind definitely. of takes you away from everything else yeah definitely that's yeah that's really good yeah but um sorry go oh, I was gonna say like I'm also quite um prone to having sort of anxiety episodes when change is around right. um I don't cope well with change so even when I'm on like holiday for example having a really good time I um can like feel myself begin to slip back into a sort of that anxious mode um and so for example in the summer you know getting out as soon as I got up in the morning like did a world of wonders because right. then it sort of sets me up for the rest of the day that's, so that's good um and yeah just before we started uh, recording you mentioned uh someone's name that on instagram that been helping you oh, as yeah well. yeah matt haig matt yeah haig. um he's brilliant i really really like him i've read one of his books um it's called spit severe it's called reasons not to die mm -hmm. but um i'm fortunate in the fact that i've never had those thoughts or feelings um but a lot of what he talks about i really resonate with with my anxiety um, and his Instagram account is amazing as well. It's like he just thinks of something and then puts it on his Instagram account. Like it's just like his thought process. Right, okay. um, and I love that. And he's, yeah, things he says are really, really helpful. And one of the things he says a lot is that not every day is a bad day and that you will eventually get better. Um, and I think that's something you have to remember when, you, mm. when you're in such a bad place. And it's nice to hear that because you can easily... Mm have the idea like what well, this is never gonna yeah. get better every day is awful but it's just maybe it just takes someone just to say yeah it's not all gonna be like this it will get better to yeah. kind of change your mindset yeah because i think when you're in that when you're in that anxious space and you're like feeling really i don't know down and and whatever it's so hard to think rationally and clearly yeah. it's so hard to remember that actually like in a few months i won't feel as bad you yeah. know maybe you still feel bad but maybe like, you still feel bad but it will get degree, easier but, yeah a hundred percent it's hard to see that the light yeah. of the tunnel when the tunnel feels so long yeah and i think the most frustrating thing with anxiety is that you can control it like it is your head mm -hmm. like it's it's something that you it's not like a physical illness where you have to sort of wait it out you know you it's so hard because your mind is so complex yet it's yours and yeah. you could do but, so much so that's why i guess why some people feel trapped because they think yeah. well this is mine but i feel out of control mm. so if i feel out of control what can i possibly do yeah but you're telling people that no you are you are in control of certain things yeah. so you can like make yourself better yeah definitely and i think i think some people are prone to things like that i think mm. i will for the rest of my life be prone to anxious like anxiety and depressive states but i know how to manage it and i know that eventually it will get easier yeah. and whereas it used to consume me for months it can only consume me for exactly. like a few hours or a and few like days if you prove to yourself like you said two years ago you wouldn't be able to go to festival now i've got to yeah. a festival you can see that progression from here i wasn't as good here i'm much better yeah i'm not completely well yeah. but i've made a big progress and yeah exactly you project that into the future mm. it means you're gonna well maybe you will be completely fine in the future yeah who you knows? don't know for sure but yeah definitely but you mentioned um like your anxiety and stuff got worse after you heard about Elisa. How yeah. how did that kind of affect you? The whole what, what happened with Elisa thing? Um, yeah, it affected me a lot as it affected everyone in our year and who knew him definitely. Um, I think at the beginning it didn't. I felt numb mm. to it, and I knew that as soon as that had happened, that I would then experience a bit of an anxiety episode right, because. Yeah you know, when big things happen like that, it, it sets it off. Um, uh, I think my biggest anxiety with it was, um, that I didn't feel like I had the right to grieve right. because I wasn't as close as some of my other friends were, which is a ridiculous thing to think. And I have spoken to people about that and they've obviously told me that's stupid. Mm. Um, cause it is, <coughs> but I think, yeah, I think I was so overwhelmed with what happened and everyone was speaking about it and it was all going on. And I think I just felt sad because I felt, yeah, I just didn't have that right to to grieve because I wasn't as close and to grieve when other people weren't right, yeah. upset. Do, does that make that, sense? That does make sense. Because you feel like, 
these people are much closer to him. Yeah. And I have the right to kind of go through what they're going through <clears throat> when it's, it's kind of slightly different. Yeah. And I think that does happen a lot. That's definitely happened to me when uh, someone else passed away. I felt like mm. I didn't have the right to go to the funeral. Mm. I ended up not going. And I felt some people like, well, why didn't you go? And I, was, yeah. I felt like I wasn't as close as you guys. I felt like I didn't have the right to go. And I kind of um, beat myself up for that yeah. because I did have the right. But at the time, I just felt like... Mm oh, it's not really me, it's more you guys. Yeah, yeah. And do you remember, like, finding out who told you or, like, how did that, or did you saw it on the... the yeah, Instagram? so, um, so obviously oh, I was going to do that Zoom prayer thing. Um, so I'm obviously of faith, um, I'm Christian, and I think in times of trouble like that, our faith is really tested. Um, yeah. And I just felt, I just remember sitting in my room at uni and being like, I can't just sit here. I can't, can't just sit and, you know, everyone was out looking for him and me just sit here and hope for the best. Um, and unfortunately, like, they found out before we could do that. So I found out before a lot of my friends did, mm. which was really hard, obviously, because I was dealing with that before, you know, the, the girls were, for example. Um, yeah, really difficult. Um, but I'm grateful that I had a good support network and I think everyone deserves a good support network. Um, and even though my uni friends maybe didn't completely understand what, what was going on, I mean, you can't unless you've experienced it. Um, you know, they were really supportive and really great and I'm really, really appreciative of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, after that, um, I did get therapy and I'd really recommend it. <laughs> um, for a long time, I didn't. Right. And I didn't talk to anyone. Um, and it's just as simple as talking to someone who doesn't know you yeah. can do so much because <coughs> there's no judgment. There's no, they don't know any background of where you've come True. from. And nothing that you tell them can get back to anybody else because exactly. they're completely separated yeah. from everyone else in your yeah, life. Yeah, exactly. And I just, it helped so much. And even though some of the, advice she was giving was very much like oh do some journaling or do headspace which is great and works for some people um she just listened and I think sometimes you just have to be there just to, to listen look, just to kind of even if they don't say too much just get it out yeah, of your head definitely and just maybe see it they'll react a little bit but it's just nice to kind of clear your own head yeah definitely which I think um therapy does help a lot yeah and I've always like thought of the idea like why did why do people find it easier to speak to random people instead of their best friends yeah. and that's kind of the whole gist of it it's the fact that like, there's not gonna be much judgment yeah it's they're just not gonna come back to people that you know or feel judged by the people yeah. you know and it's just a, ta- a chance to just get things off your head and then mm. close the door and then go back to mm-hmm. your kind of regular life yeah and I think also the best thing about talking to therapy um people and counsellors is that sometimes they've actually been through it as well Mm. and I think that really helps I think um yeah in lockdown was difficult um I'm really grateful I have an amazing family and they're very supportive but they've not experienced mental health like I have they haven't you know had depression or had anxiety attacks Mm. and I think it's really hard to completely open up to people when they don't, don't really fully understand. understand. But with like a counsellor, they've been like trained to kind yeah. of deal with these kind of conversations. Mm-hmm. So it must make it easier. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I always find talking to friends who have who have been through sort of similar things that I've been through really helpful because you can kind of like sort of swap notes on things yeah, and like, like your buddy for yeah, it yeah 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 and help each other through the yeah but like, oh i remember feeling like this and this is what i did yeah and, oh, i remember feeling like that this is what i did yeah 100 kind of percent help each other to come up yeah it makes it feel less lonely as well because yeah. i think anxiety in itself is quite a lonely feeling you know it, it's mm-hmm. all in your head and you're very isolated yeah and it's and that's one of the problems it's it's the feeling alone when you mm. have like a mental issue or some kind of problem <clears throat> sorry and you, you look around and you think oh everyone's mm. fine and look what I'm dealing with no one has no no one has any idea what's going up in here yeah but then like I said when you have a friend you go, oh I'm not alone you'll feel like this as well and it kind mm. of relaxes you makes you feel like oh, I'm not crazy it's just this is just part of life yeah definitely yeah. yeah 100% um you mentioned that you you're Christian and stuff and that the death of death of Elisa like tested your faith mm-hmm. do you feel like it did you lose any of your faith at that point or like how did you feel in terms of like a Christian point of view? Mm, good question. 
Um, yeah, I found it hard because, I mean, obviously we're taught that God loves everyone and, you know, he's here for us all the time. So how could he let a friend pass like that and be in such a bad mental space? Um, you know, even times when I felt anxious myself, you know, why, why are you letting this happen to me? Mm. Um, so it's definitely been tested, but I always keep coming back to it. I always find some kind of peace in it, even in the darkest times. Um, literally just the other weekend, I felt really on edge and really anxious and just a lot going on in my head, even though my life is literally fine. <laughs> um, and I just felt like I needed to go to church, I needed to just like be in that sort of spiritual zone mm -hmm. um and it just did me the world of good and i think when i do things like that i'm reminded that yeah i'm safe and um he is like working in us um i mean faith isn't for everyone of course and um but yeah for me it's something i always come back to even in dark times and right. but it's definitely been tested 100 yeah, percent. yeah and do you think you wouldn't be where you are today if you didn't have your faith or the person that you are today yeah i agree yeah no i wouldn't be um yeah it's made it makes me who i am and i think it gives me the inner strength to continue to carry on. carry on um yeah i mean i don't know where i'd be without it but um in sort of my darkest times with those thoughts and my panic attacks and social anxiety mm. Um, I always look to that and that right. got me through Makes just sense. about so, so and yeah because you talked about coping mechanisms yeah <clears throat> ideally sports but then also you have like, kind of God on your side as well were there any other like um, mechanisms that, that kind of helped you cope with things um good question hmm they maybe learnt from others or like that heart hardly hardly what was that guy? Matt Haig. Matt Haig. Matt Haig. <laughs> Think of a football, a football player. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just, I was just, obviously in lockdown, I was constantly scrolling as mm. we all were. Um, so I found a lot of good Instagram accounts. Um, Dr. Julie is one. Um, she's really helpful. Um, someone else who I can't remember off the top of my head. But just like little Instagram accounts that, you know, this big community of people who were posting about their experiences mm. and how they cope. And I think it's just knowing that you're not the only one because yeah. <laughs> you're not. Um, and how, how much would you emphasize the, like the idea of like speaking out if you need help or just like reaching out to people if you think like you can't manage on your own? Oh, um, yeah. Absolutely speak out. I mean, it's the scariest thing to do mm. because for me, um, sort of year 10, 11, when I felt really bad, I thought if I spoke out, it would make it real. So do you know what I mean? That it would make sense, it more yeah. more real. If I don't say anything, maybe it will go maybe away. Maybe it will go away. Yeah. Like I can just push it to, a, to the side. Whereas speaking mm. it, it's like, oh, I've got anxiety or like, oh, I feel really depressed. Like, it's like putting a label on it. Yeah. Like, okay, now I'm stuck with it. Yeah. Kind of thing. But I've got through that now, thank goodness. Um, but talking to people is just, it just, it's like a weight lifts off of you. Mm. You know, it doesn't go away. It doesn't, doesn't always necessarily get easier but but it can give you that kind of yeah brief moment to kind of breathe and then maybe you can help f figure <coughs> <coughs> sorry that's all right figure out your own problems because yeah you've kind of had that like little respite to let <clears throat> yourself talk about yeah 100 percent. no it's so important and even if it's not therapy you know yeah. just friends and family who yeah. care um and maybe someone who's experienced it and do you feel like it's with the friends you have it's easy like without a doubt you could say anything to your friends and stuff like that yeah definitely um 100 percent. i mean my home my home girls <laughs> um they're amazing and i know a lot of them have have been through similar experiences and um it's very easy to talk to them um but especially over the first lockdown i did find myself distancing myself from people because i felt so rubbish mm. um it's quite common with anxiety um or depression or whatever you just want to distance yourself you can't you can't find the energy or the effort to speak to people or to yeah. do things and that could be like accelerated by the fact that you weren't actually allowed to go out and talk to people yeah so you could kind of use that as an excuse <coughs> use it as an excuse to um to to not have to speak to them yeah. to easily distance yourself yeah 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 100 and you know 
my anxiety didn't make me a very nice person in lockdown and I recognize that now but when you're in that headspace the only thing I wanted to do was lay in bed all day and not get out of bed and not um yeah not oh what's the word be proactive uh face the day I didn't want to face the day um because it was just too hard and I I knew it would be another day of feeling anxious and stressed and and depressed Right, and so to talk about um, depression, how would you describe that? Because I think it's slightly different for everyone, but yeah. there's like a, some people, luckily, by like a miracle, haven't experienced a lot of these things. And uh, it's very lucky for that to be the case. So for those people, how would you kind of like describe depression to them? Um, I think for me, depression was, especially over COVID, just this intense numbness this sadness mm. this like loss of enjoyment in life mm. but it's not to the point where you're like crying because you're sad it's like no it's no like no numb, it's just like numb level. like constant feeling of like oh like you know today <laughs> and that wasn't in like it wasn't the the problem with depression and anxiety is that you could have like a really really great life you know i've i love my life like i love my friends my boyfriend my family but that doesn't mean that depression and anxiety don't come towards you because they do. It doesn't discriminate. Um, yeah, a numb, constant feeling, 100%. And just this like loss of effort and energy to face the day and to face activities you mm. would want to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I do understand that. Yeah. Even just the other day, I was just like, I was laying in bed. I'd work the day before and yeah. I'd work the day after and I was just like, I knew that today was the only day where I could just kind of do nothing. Mm. And I kind of like got into my fields, start thinking about Elisa, mm. start thinking about all my uni friends, all my friends going back to uni. Yeah. I was going to be alone. I don't really know what I was doing with my life. Mm. So I was just kind of laying in my bed, just like watching something on my laptop and not really feeling anything. I kept mm. like turning off, sleeping, <coughs> waking up again and just thinking like, I literally, I don't feel anything right now. I don't feel mm. sad. I don't yeah. feel... It's just a complete numbness and just mm-hmm. kind of waiting for the time to tick by. Mm-hmm. And you you noticed it. I noticed it and I was just thinking, like, I just felt like I don't, I didn't care. Mm. Like, I didn't care. Like, I'm just kind of wasting the day, just chilling here. Mm. I just felt completely nothing. And just, mm. yeah, my mum came in saying, every now and then my mum asked me, like, are you sure you don't need therapy? Because I didn't, I didn't, I haven't had therapy for Elisa. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And sometimes she thinks that I should have it. Mm. But personally, I, I, th- I, most of the time I do think I'm all right, but some days are harder than others. And some days, like, mm. um, like at least it does creep into, yeah. into my head. Mm. Not in a weird way, but... No. Um, I think he does for us all. Yeah, and it's just... Yeah. And it's one thing people say things like, oh, he'd be so proud of you for what you're doing mm. right now. Like, every time people say stuff like that, it just really kind of kicks in hits a chord mm, it mm-hmm. really hits a chord and I just yeah. think like if he was just here to see and then ah, I don't know mm. it's tough but most of the time I am, I am okay it's just certain days are just harder than others I think yeah 100% and you recognise that yeah. and that's the most important thing is that you recognise that and that some days are going to be really really super hard and then other days you'll be okay with it you'll mm. be at peace you'll remember him for the good times and you'll remember him in a happy way yeah um and that's how he'd want you to remember him that's what what he'd want all of us to do 100%. but i mean you know that is the importance of this podcast is that we we are speaking openly you know um i could have very easily come on here and held back a lot of information and not said as much but what's the point you know mm. if it helps someone then that's amazing. So, yeah, that's kind of the idea. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, just encourage more people to speak out and like just, it's really not worth it. Like mm. you'd rather speak out and someone, it, maybe someone does judge you, judge you for what you say. You'd rather that than having to come to the point where your family, your friends, everyone that's ever loved you is completely missing you because mm-hmm. you thought it'd be better if you weren't around. A hundred percent. Which yeah. I think is just a horrible thought that anyone has to have, but yeah, but it does happen. It does happen mm-hmm. way too often. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, definitely. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> I don't know. I, I thought my cough had gone. 
today. No. <laughs> Not today. I'm just going to take a breather for a sec. Go for it. So speaking about anxiety, did you know it affected you at school? How did it also affect you at university as well? Um, so uni has been very up and down for me. Um, I'm very excited to go back next week to start a fresh new year, like lots of things going on. Um, but first year was really hard. And again, this is something I've wanted to share, um, particularly in like schools and stuff. But hopefully um, I can do that at some point. But um, I think A-levels, there was so much pressure and there was also so much talk about first year halls being the best time of your life. Like right. you're going to have the best time. And I think it, it just wasn't that for me. And it actually was a very lonely experience. Um, yeah, I was in, as I said before, I was in a very quiet flat and um, with a woman who was caring for another girl um, who was and not a very nice person. Um, and we had lots of troubles with her. Um, and I just didn't get that uni experience that I had expected. Mm, or that everyone had like preached about. So exactly. Like, and, you know, out of my friendship group from home, I, had the, I was the only one that had gone. So, you know, my friends were like off traveling and I just felt just very numb and like lonely and anxious. And again, I think my social anxiety sparked uh, was sparked from that as well um because then when I would go out um for example when I went to visit my other half at uni you know it was so I had the best times and like we had so much fun and like we'd go out with his friends and you know I'd spend time with him and then I remember just like dreading coming back to uni and having to because I knew when I got back mm. I would be walking into an empty flat no people you know my friends that were in other flats they had to be in the flat to let me in. So, you know, they had to want to see me. Yeah. Um, and it was just really isolating and lonely. And in some sense, you know, COVID cut that short for me. Um, obviously it got worse yeah. with the lockdown, but um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a weird time uni. And I think, don't get me wrong. That's not everyone's experience. Um, but, I think, yeah, just making sure you've got the right support network and you know where sort of the student services is, you know where there are people to talk to if you need to. Yeah. Because I remember I was, I think I was six days into uni and I went to student services and you know the voice you get when you're trying to hold back the tears. Yeah. I sounded ridiculous, but I was, was so... Like yeah. <laughs> um, and I just, yeah, I just felt so anxious and out of place. Um and, and do you think it had to do with the fact that it was like a new new change, big change for you as well? Yeah, like definitely. A hundred percent. I think uni's massive. Um I know my sister's literally gone off this weekend, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, it's scary for everyone. It's a weird time. And I think to add to that, I just was not put in sort of my flat. Um, you know, I, nowadays I'd call myself a people person. I like being around people, I like being busy. Um, and it just wasn't that and I really struggled with that. Um so yeah, that was a hard time. And that was first year. That and was first second year. year was... Second year was good. Obviously we were in lockdown, so I was back and forth a lot and um, being in the house like 24 seven gets quite intense. Um, but, you know, I'm glad to have the friends I did make in the end. Um, and you're in the house now? Yeah, I'm in the house now. Yeah, yeah. A lot better than halls. Yeah, so much better than horse. So much better than mm. horse. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm content where I am now, and I think my um, my mom actually asked me the other day. She said, "Do you think your anxiety is like done? Do you think you're over it, or do you think it's a working progress?" No. I definitely say it's a working progress. It's always a working progress. Definitely. You know, I'm better and I can cope with it, and um, I can speak more openly about it, but. You know, I definitely have days where I'm I'm very anxious yeah. and, you know, times I'll be sitting in bed and I won't be able to sleep because I'm just head to toe in anxiety for no reason. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But you but you would say that like without, with all the priorities, you'd say focus mainly your mental health, mental health yeah. first and then build from there. A hundred percent. That should be everyone's number one priority. I didn't do that in sixth form, didn't do that in first year uni and that meant that my mental health was at an all-time low and I was not a 
not a nice person. I was just snappy all the time and grumpy and you know, that's not me. And um, yeah, mental health before everything. And if that means putting your coping mechanisms before everything, if that yeah. means, I don't know, going for a run before you do like, I don't know, vision or something, then do it yeah, because- definitely. So definitely put that first. And then, 100%. Because you won't be able to function in the other no, areas exactly. of your life if you're feeling not yourself. No, yeah, exactly. But, yeah. And then you're going into your final year now? Yeah, final year. Um, yeah. What do you study? History. History. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The so. past. The past. <laughs> and you're excited? <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. I think this is going to be good. And my biggest aim is just to get back out, meeting new people, nice. um, having a good time. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks on. for having me. Uh, cheers for listening, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, we'll cut it there. I just wanted to add this to the end of the podcast and to say that um, after having a chat with my mum, I think that I am going to go for counselling and get some sort of therapy and talk to someone because I think for a long time I sort of maybe lied to myself thinking I am okay, like I can get through this. But then as times have gone on, I've realised that I actually do need some help and like do need to talk to someone, talk to someone about it, someone that's not like part of my family, someone that is separate. And um, I just feel sort of, not depressed, but sort of like maybe burnt out from like working and podcasts and all this sort of stuff. And I think like, I just need to maybe just get some help just for a bit and just see how it goes. So I'm just encouraging anyone else who needs help. Like it might be scary to ask for help or stuff like that, but like I really do encourage just go and speak to someone because I mean, it could do the world good, and if it doesn't, you're back where you are, but if it does, like, good things can really come of it, so, yeah, I'll still add that on, thank you for listening, yeah, cheers.